Thank you, Nick. And it's a real honour to be here for the first in-person meeting from, for PMI UK chapter for I think 18 months or maybe a little longer. Uh, it's, it's really great to be, to be together. Um, I'm a fellow of PMI and I support PMI. I think PMI is a great organisation. Uh, we can learn a lot from PMI, but PMI is, is us, is, um, is the members and PMI will only be what we put into PMI. So I would encourage you, if you are a member, to get actively involved, uh, to be involved in your chapter, to be involved in the community, uh, and to, to make sure that you make PMI to be what you want it to be. I'm also an honorary fellow of APM, the UK Association for Project Management. There are only two people in the world who hold both honorary fellowships, uh, myself and, and somebody in, in the States. Um, so I do that because I'm interested in project management, not in organizations. So uh, APM is great, PMI is great, IPMA is fine. Um, the important thing is that we use these <coughs> institutions to help us make a difference. Projects are how we change the world, and that's what we're all in this for. Um, now, you might notice <coughs> I have a little husky voice. This isn't my normal voice. Um, I don't have COVID, but I have had a really nasty cold for three weeks. And so there is a little risk uh, that I don't make it through, but I've done all my backups. I've got lozenges and water and all sorts. So um, hopefully that will be my voice will last out uh, for the time. Talking of the time, there's a design fault with this room. The only clock is there and I can't see it and you can. So I have no idea how long I'm talking for. This is a new presentation that I've developed especially for today. And so I have no idea, no idea how long this is going to last either. Um, so if you start walking out, I'll know that the clock says 8 o'clock or something. Um, but hopefully I plan to talk for about 40, 45 minutes. And then I'll take some questions from the floor. For those of you who are online, uh, please put your questions in the chat box. Uh, Merv White is here monitoring the chat box and he'll pick up questions that you put online and, uh, and feed them back to us here. So um, I'd like to leave questions to the end just because of logistics, if that's okay. So <clears throat> sustainable business. I'm focusing this talk at the business level initially, although I know we're interested in project management, but projects contribute to successful businesses. And if the business is not sustainable, we won't have any projects. So what I want to do is to introduce some new ideas to you about how we can make sustainability practical at the business and project level. There's a lot of talk about sustainability. We've got COP26 going on just at the moment. We're talking about climate change, net zero, uh, about um, you know, all sorts of nationally determined contributions, all sorts of jargon. What does it actually mean for us practically? Um, as Nick very kindly said, I am a, a thought leader in risk management, so, so I have ideas, but I only want to have ideas that work in practice, that make a difference to help us manage risk on our projects and be more successful in dealing with uncertainty wherever we find it. Um, and so for me, <clears throat> if it's not practical, then it has no value. I mean, in, ideas are interesting, but practicality is where we make a difference. So I want to share with you some practical ideas that you can take away and use in your businesses and projects to really make a difference. And there will be some work for you to do at the end after I've shared these ideas, these frameworks with you, if you want to put it into practice. So I'm going to be as practical as I can, but if you want to implement it, you need to make it specific for your business and your projects, and that's work for you to do. So I'm now pressing my forward button, and nothing's happening. So this is our first, first technical challenge, but I've now found the right button, and that's fine. Sorry. <coughs> He's, he's really worried. <laughs> this lady is um, Bro Brunfels. Uh, she was the Prime Minister of Norway in the 1980s, and sustainability was defined in the United Nations context by the Brundtland Commission, where they defined sustainability as being able to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability to meet the needs of the future. And that was quite a long time ago. So this is now 34 years ago. Um, since then, we've had the Millennium Development Goals and more recently, the uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. I was very pleased to see there's a climate action exhibition just in the foyer here from the School of Architecture, uh, which is um, listing a whole lot of different projects, um, which are trying to put some of these goals into practice. But if you look at some of the, some of the things that are here, no poverty, ending hunger, um, you know, gender, gender equality, these things are very big. How do we actually deal with those in our businesses and in our projects? What do all those sustainable development goals actually mean in practice for you and for me as we're trying to do our thing, manage our projects and, and have successful business, businesses and meet the needs of our customers and clients and our shareholders and stakeholders? What do these SDGs have to do with you and me? 
they're great sort of global goals, and and you know, and they're all really important, but they're very hard to implement, aren't they? How do we you know get rid of the hunger in 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 our projects? Very few of us are actually working in that kind of area. So we need to have something that takes that and makes it more practical and applicable. And so I'd like to think more practically about where sustainability comes from and how we can ensure it in our businesses and projects. So I define sustainability as being driven by resources. Sustainability means the timely availability, timely, we have to have the right things at the right time, of necessary resources, the things we actually need, in the required quality and quantity. And I think each of those words is important. So we've got to have the right resources in the required quantity and quality at the right time. And that will make us sustainable. We can keep going if we have the resources we need when we need them. And so a sustainable business will manage its necessary resources in a way that avoids long-term depletion, that saves us getting those resources wasted and running out, and also ideally adds to the resource pool so that we keep having the resources that we need as our businesses go forward. And that's what sustainable business is, managing our necessary resources in a way that avoids them running out and ideally keeps re replenishing the pool so that they're there when we need them. So these two words, conserve and enhance, I think those are key words for sustainability. So what about sustainability risk? What does sustainability risk mean? If you're familiar, as some of you who are doing risk classes at the university might be, or, or project management classes, you may be familiar with ISO 31000. It's the international standard in risk management. It defines risk as the effect of uncertainty on objectives. So is sustainability risk the effect of uncertainty on sustainability? Or if you're uh, involved with PMI and you're familiar with the PIMBOT guide um, and the, the old risk management definition that we had in the old, in the old PIMBOT guide, uh, the sixth edition, I won't say anything about the seventh edition because we're being recorded. But, <clears throat> so here's, here's a definition that looks a bit like the, the PMI definition of risk, which is the effect of um, un uncertain events or conditions that if they occur will affect the achievement of, of our objectives. Is sustainability risk and uncertainty that if it occurs will affect timely availability of necessary resources, which is how we define sustainability. Is that how we would define sustainable sustainability risk? I would say not, not for businesses, because the business does not exist in order to achieve sustainability. That is not what our businesses and our projects are for. Businesses and projects exist to meet their objectives. That's what we're in business for. We have stakeholders, we have shareholders, we have products and services that people want and need, and we have to produce those in a way and at a price that they can afford and use. That's what we're doing to change the world, right? That's, that's who we are. So what we're doing is not being sustainable, we're meeting our objectives. We just want to meet those objectives in a sustainable way. So risk is any uncertainty that if it occurs will affect our objectives. Risk is always and only about achievement of objectives. If I had a dollar for, or a pound for every time I said the word objectives as a risk person, I would be very rich, but I'm, I'm not because I don't charge. Actually, I do charge, though. just thought I'd mention that. So if risk is uh, any uncertainty that if it occurs will affect achievement of objectives, then sustainability risk is an uncertainty in availability of those necessary resources in a timely manner in the required quality and quantity. It's the availability of resources that is the risk. It's not availability of the resources, it's the impact. We're not trying to manage uncertainties that will affect sustainability. We're trying to stay in business. We're trying to deliver successful projects. And we want to do that in a sustainable way. So sustainability is the risk. It's not a type of impact. And it's really important that we see that. We're trying to manage uncertainties that affect sustainability so that, as projects and businesses, we can deliver our objectives. It's all about objectives. Does that make sense? You could do non-verbal, like nod or shake or... Hmm? I see a sm All right, a thumbs up. Thank you, that would do. <laughs> okay, that's a really important definition. So sustainability risk management is like standard risk management, but if we're going to be looking at uncertainties that affect availability of necessary resources, then we need to know what our necessary resources are. And because we're looking at achieving our objectives, risk is uncertainty that affects objectives, we need to, need to know what our objectives are, and we need to link necessary resources with objectives. That's a prior condition to being able to manage sustainability risk. 
We need to know what our objectives are and what the necessary resources are. And then we need to work out which of those resources are vulnerable so we can manage risk to those, because that is what will affect our objectives, because we've seen the link between resources and objectives. And if we're going to do risk management, which requires identifying and prioritizing and quantifying and responding to risk, we need to be able to prioritize those things, which means we need to be able to measure them. And we're talking about uncertainty that affects objectives, two dimensions, the uncertainty dimension and the effects dimension. You might call it probability and impact, you might call it likelihood and consequence, it doesn't matter what you call it, there are two dimensions. So we have to be able to measure and express that uncertainty in a measurable way when we're talking about the effect of necessary resources on our objectives. You with me so far? So we're still doing the kind of the, the theory so far. So standard risk management, but with these three things first. What are my objectives and the necessary resources and how are they related? Which of those resources are most vulnerable? So a vulnerability assessment. And then how do I express that in terms of impact criteria? What do I mean by high, medium and low impact, for example, on those necessary resources and how they affect my objectives? Once I've got those things clear, then I can start to manage sustainability risk. Unless I know these things, I can't even start a risk management process. Okay, so shall we do it? Shall I just show you how that process looks in practice? We need to do these, these first three things first. Now, I'm not going to talk about setting objectives. That isn't really part of risk management. It is part of business management, strategy, uh, project management, program management, portfolio management, and so on. I would hope we know how to set our objectives. As a risk practitioner, I know that's often not the case, and that actually risk people have to help their clients to set their objectives and define them clearly, smart, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound, all of that stuff. And not just well-defined, but properly communicated so that all of our stakeholders and shareholders understand what our objectives are and agree to them. We have to have consensus on our objectives, otherwise we're all pointing in different directions. So objectives need to be coherent and aligned. But that's not risk management, that's just objective setting, and, and it's really, really important, but it's not part of my job as a risk person. Somebody, somebody has to do it. So we ought to know our objectives. The question is, if we're going to link strategic objectives with necessary resources, how do we know what are the necessary resources? And this is the key to understanding sustainability in business and being able to manage sustainability risk in our big business and projects. Understanding how we can work out what are the necessary resources that enable us to achieve our strategic objectives. So I'd like to offer you a new framework, not really very new, but it'll be probably new to you, and certainly in the risk management world, I've not seen it used elsewhere other than in my own practice, uh, a framework that will help you work out which resources are necessary for your business for strategic <coughs> objectives. And then through the strategic objectives of your business, that then flows down to the objectives of our programs, projects, portfolios, and, and operations. So, where do we get a framework for identifying necessary resources? I was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, which exists, has existed for 280 years to change society. So RSA has a whole range of different initiatives, um, which is aimed at developing society in a more effective way. Um, it's based in uh, just, just down the road here, actually. And one of their initiatives is called Tomorrow's Company. Um, I wasn't part of that, I was part of the Risk Commission, which was a, a, a different, uh, different challenge. But out of Tomorrow's Company, one of their uh, spin-off um, uh, initiatives was called the Forum for the Future in 2007. And they developed something called the Five Capitals Model. Now I've got the, the link is here on the slide. I recommend you to take a look at the link here. So it's forumforthefuture.org slash the five capitals, separate by dashes. And the idea here was thinking about sustainability for businesses. How do we know what are the necessary resources? Are, are three exactly the question that we're now asking? So what they start with is the idea of requiring capital. So you need capital to run a business. And if you don't have capital, you can't invest, you can't um, create anything, you can't innovate, you don't have any equipment, you don't have anything, no resources. So clearly we need capital. But what they did and the, the insight that they came up with in 2007 through this project 
was the idea that there is more to capital than money. There are other types of capital. And you might have heard of some of these actually recently. So they defined five different types of capital assets that we need to use, that we need to invest and spend in order to create value through our organizations, businesses, projects and programs. So of course we need to have assets of money, financial assets, that we can spend in order to create value. But there are other types of assets that we also need to spend, in inverted commas, in order to create value. And they call them natural capital, human capital, social capital, manufactured capital, and of course financial capital. And they say in the, in the report that was written in 2007, you can see it on the, at this link, a sustainable organization will maintain and, where possible, enhance their stocks of capital assets in each of these five categories, rather than deplete or degrade them. So necessary resources are not just money. They're defined under these five headings, according to the Forum for the Future. And I'd like to recommend this framework to you. I've used it in practice with clients uh, in what I'm going to share with you, and, and it works really well. So you might be familiar with the idea of the triple bottom line. We don't just have the bottom line of money, are we profitable? But there's money, there is profit, but also people and planet. The triple bottom line has been around for quite a long time. The five capitals is a development of the triple bottom line. So it goes from three to five. And it suggests that there are these five different capitals, so natural, human, social, financial, and manufactured, are a development of, of the three. And here are the definitions that are in the report. We start with finance, because that's where it came from. Financial capital is the traditional economic measures. I'll give you some examples of these uh, in a while. Uh, then, of course, we've got the people, uh, sorry, the, well, the, the natural resources, uh, our raw materials and those sorts of things, and the people. So we have to have people. This is the, the traditional um, profit planet people. But they added these extra two. One is manufactured capital, the, the kind of equipment and resource, the assets that we need, the buildings and the processes and the infrastructure in order to create value. And then also, we don't exist with project, as projects or businesses in isolation. We are part of communities, we have a stakeholder network, we have a whole range of different people who are involved, who influence our projects and our businesses and who we in turn influence, the definition of a, of a stakeholder. So, <coughs> excuse me. So these five capitals are defined in the, the five capitals model from Forum for the Future. What we need to do if we're going to link resources to objectives to define our necessary, uh, necessary resources to manage sustainability risk is for each of our strategic objectives under each of the five capitals, put some detail. What specifically do we need in order to achieve our objectives under this heading? So here are some examples. Under financial um, resources, obviously we've got money, cap capital expenditure and operating expenditure, things like shareholder funds or loans, bonds, banks, uh, bank loans, bank accounts, cash reserves, all those sorts of things, all of the standard financial capital. Clearly we need those things to run a business and if we run out of any of those, we're gonna be in trouble. You know, profit is important, but cash is king. Right? If you ever run a business, remember that. Um, so what do we need then under natural capital? Natural capital covers raw materials, things like steel and timber and concrete, the things that you get in order to process to make a product of some sort. Um, fuel, electricity, gas, um, wherever it comes from, water, air, anything that comes from the natural environment, our ecological resources. So things that are natural that we use in our business and process them to create products and services. That's what's covered by natural capital. In terms of human capital, it's not just bodies. You don't just want warm bodies sitting in an office or on a factory um, production line. They have to know what they're doing. They have to have skills. They have to have energy. If they're all, oh, I can't talk about. Now, that's not going to help anybody. They've got to be able to, and they have to be motivated, and they have to have commitment and mental well-being. All these things, health is really important. You know, the human capital is much more than warm bodies sitting on seats, isn't it? It's really important we look after our people. We know that. And then manufactured capital is the buildings, our factories, our offices, and the systems, so communication systems, IT services, internet, and so on, infrastructure, transport, all of those things that, that we use, that we uh, absorb or we, um, we sit within when we're making our, our business work. 
And then finally, social capital. And we would, in the project management world, just call these stakeholders, our stakeholder network. So the other people who are involved in our business, who are necessary for us to do our business or to execute our projects. So the supply chain uh, partners, trade unions, non-government organizations, charities, government, regulators. And in some organizations, the goodwill of the community. We might call this license to operate in inverted commas. Some organizations literally need a license to operate. But when we're working with the general public, we need a, a, a goodwill license to operate well. You know, it's important that we have the goodwill of all of our stakeholders. These are the things that are covered under, state, un, under social capital. So the idea is that for each strategic objective, under each of these five headings, you write down the things that you need in order to run your business. We're doing this at, first of all, the strategic business level. Okay, are you all still with me? A sort of nod, thumbs up from this man, thank you. <laughs> He's the one who's got the thumb for everybody. If you don't agree, you want to do this, I guess. <laughs> Is everybody okay online? Thumbs up? Are they happy online? Oh, I've got a thumbs up for them. Okay, so now we've worked out what are our necessary resources. By using the five capitals of heading and linking them to our strategic objectives, we know what we need financially, in terms of raw materials from the natural environment, in terms of our people, what knowledge and skills we need, um, in terms of our, our, our Sort of physical assets, our buildings and systems, and in terms of our stakeholder network. We know what we need. Which of these are vulnerable? Which of these are, are at risk? If we did a structured vulnerability assessment, we could find out which of these resources are necessary that we need in order to sustain our business. So we worked out all the ones that, that we need, but some of them are going to be at risk. When we're doing a sustainability risk assessment, we need to know which of these resources are vulnerable. And we can do that using two dimensions. The first is how badly do we need them? So we have a criticality. And I've suggested here a four point scale. You could do it with three or five. This will be very familiar to, to our risk colleagues. This is a little bit like probability. So we might say the criticality is, not, I don't care, not essential. It'd be nice to have, it doesn't really matter. It's important, if we don't have this, there will be some limitations. It's really important, we actually need this, it's required, or it's business critical. So you've got degrees of criticality. How important is this resource? And linked to that, how available is it? Or in terms of thinking about risk, how unavailable is it? So if we have something which has unrestricted access, that's fine. If we have something where we've got severely limited access, we only have one supplier who's you know, got lots of um, complications, difficulties, and maybe they've got other competing demands and all sorts of things like that, or highly regulated, then we could be in trouble. So we've got non-essential important, required and business critical on the criticality side. Then we've got how available it is, unrestricted, generally available, constrained or severely limited. And then we could just do a standard kind of heat map. So again, very familiar to our, our risk people. I put some numbers in here. They don't really matter. It might be helpful if you want to quantify. It's Again, it's a, it's a risk style heat map. And then we can just say, well, the ones we really want to focus on are, of course, the top right-hand corner, where they're required or business critical, and the availability is constrained or severely limited. Ah, that could be really difficult. Those are the ones we need to focus on. We cannot be sustainable if any resources that sit in that top right-hand corner are at risk, if we lose them. Right? So obviously, if you've got something which is business critical but unrestricted, that's fine or business critical but generally available, that's fine. Or you've got something which is um, highly restricted, but we don't care about it, it doesn't really matter, that's fine. So you know, this is, these are the ones that we need to, to worry about. This is all fairly straightforward, isn't it? So now, how do we turn that into something we can use in a risk process? And this is where we need to do some hard thinking. The easiest way I've found is to actually give you an example. So this is something I've actually done with, with some clients. I'm going to give you an example. But we need to work out for each of the resources, the ones that are vulnerable, how will we assess the degree of vulnerability? If this resource is at risk, how do we quantify the risk? And we need to have impact scales. So we would have, um, for each of these vulnerable resources, a risk impact scale, like high, medium, and low type scale, 
that says this is how we know, this is how we know how bad it will be, how significant it will be, how important or not. So we select relevant measures to reflect the effect of the vulnerable resources on objectives. We're not talking about um, something which says how unavailable the resource is, because that's taken care of in the vulnerability assessment. And we're not saying how critical is it, because that's also in the vulnerability assessment. Now we're saying how much does it matter? So if this resource that was severely limited and business critical actually turned out not to be available, what would the impact be on our objectives? Remember, the business and its projects exist to meet the objectives. We don't exist to be sustainable. So if we were unsustainable in one of these necessary resources, what would it do to us? And that's what we're trying to work out now, the impact of the objectives. So we want to have relevant measures for each of our strategic objectives, against which we can measure the effect of our necessary resources. Okay? So let's give you an example. This is from a, a company in South Africa, as it happens. Here are some specific measures of how you would measure the effect of a necessary resource financially. Under the finan financial capital, we've got things like operating margin, cash, cash generation, working capital, and then on our project side, schedule, 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 time variance, cost variance, scope change, and so on. These are, if, if we lose a critical resource, this is how we'll know in a way that we can measure with dollars or pounds or euros. Okay. Um, what about um, manufactured capital? If we lost something that was critical or that was severely limited, how would we know? In terms of operations, we want to know about our production levels, productivity levels, systems availability, energy usage, and so on. And then in terms of compliance, um, factory closures, if we were non-compliant with regulatory uh, requirements, legal fines, and so on. What about people? Health and safety, you've obviously got the whole safety thing from injuries right the way through to fatalities, occupational uh, hazards, and so on. And then in, in um, natural capital, environmental impacts, so things that have to be reported to your environmental agencies or, or regulators. And finally, in terms of the social capital, stakeholder relations, usually measured through the media, but also it might be in your, in your sort of business, things like customer complaints. These are things that are measurable, that are indicators of, what, of why a lack of a necessary resource would matter to your business. These are things we can measure and use, so we've got an uncertainty on the available resources side, which we can assess, which we do through our vulnerability assessment. Now we've got an impact statement, which says if this happens, this is how much it matters to our business or our projects. This is, happens to be at the business level. Now we can do a risk assessment. So we've got some measures here. What we need to do is to quantify them, to say, well, for each of these now, if these are the, the ways we're going to tell how much lack of a sustainable resource would matter if it happened, we need to quantify it. So what does a low impact in core operating margin mean, or a high impact? Uh, if we are thinking about potential civil li liabilities, what is a medium level of impact or an extreme level of impact? Um, in terms of uh, environmental incidents, what, what is okay and what is a disaster? We need to have something measurable. Okay? So risk management is about measuring. It's about trying to quantify the uncertainty. So here's, here are the examples. Taking those sort of headings, and I really don't want to go into the detail. Oh, we're okay. <coughs> put that in front of my screen? Um, <laughs> So here we've got some taking those measures, which are derived from the effect of the vulnerable resources on our strategic objectives. Now we're going to put some high, medium, and low boundaries around them. And these are real examples for, for a particular client company of mine. Um, so we've actually got percentage changes in performance or productivity, uh, amounts of delay or cost variance. Uh, this is low, here's a medium set, here's a high set. And you can see there are others in between, it's actually a five point scale. Um, you can see how we're gradually increasing the degrees of impact, and these are agreed with the board, or the exco, or the management committee, you know, whoever's in charge of the, of the entity. And so we're actually saying now, we know that this matters. If a vulnerable resource becomes unavailable, 
This is how we're going to measure its effect on our strategic objectives. And this is how we're going to go high, medium, and low to actually define for our business what that means. Are you still with me? Okay, good. It's hard, hard work to produce this kind of, of output. You can't just sort of click your fingers or, or sit down over a cup of coffee with a few mates and scribble this out. Um, it took me and one of my senior colleagues three days with three of the senior executives working flat out to produce the tables that we've got here. You know? uh, and we knew what we were doing. So, it, it, you know, there's some work involved here. So now, if we move on to the risk side, and I'm, I'm beginning to wind down here now. Um, sustainability risk management has these three prerequisites. We know what our objectives are, hopefully, and we've worked out what are the necessary resources using the five capitals. We've then done a vulnerability assessment, looking at criticality and availability, to work out which of those necessary resources are vulnerable. And we've turned that vulnerability into measurable impacts against our strategic objectives. Now we can do risk assessment, at last. So we can identify the risks to the vulnerable resources that will cause them to become unavailable and therefore affect our objectives. And then we can use the standard risk approach to prioritize them. We might want to quantify them, do some kind of modeling, Monte Carlo simulation or something like that, or influence diagrams or system dynamics or something else if necessary, then we develop and implement our responses and we have a look and see if that works and then we go back and do it again. Standard risk management, easy peasy, you can do that. You can do that. So sustainability risk management, once we understand what we're trying to achieve, what we need in order to achieve it, where the vulnerabilities are and how much it matters, then we just have to do risk management and see what are the risks actually to those vulnerable resources, which if they happen, would hit our objectives at these levels of impact. Great, isn't it? Now, we've talked about doing this at the business level because you have to start at the business level. It's really important that we start at the strategic level and understand the vulnerabilities of our business before we start thinking about projects and programs. Really important. Because if we have a, a wonderful, sustainable, you know, um, A-grade project, within an unsustainable business, it doesn't, you know, we're all going to be in trouble. We've got to get the business level right first. Projects and programs exist in the context of a business. So we've got to get the businesses sustainable first. And then once we've done that, we can start to, to roll it down through the organization. So our strategic business level risk assessment criteria, those high, medium and low statements, which I showed you, reflect the corporate risk appetite. So when we talk to the board or the exco or the management team, and we say, if you didn't get, if you had some, some variation in core operating profits, what really, really matters? You know, what level would you have to resign? What level would you be you know, going to the analysts, going, going to the market and saying, we've got a warning here? And what level are you saying, oh, not, not very nice, but we don't care too much? That's the corporate risk appetite. And that's what we're doing at the strategic business level, understanding how sustainability would hit us as a business and what we need to do to manage that. What we need to do at lower levels is to roll down those thresholds in a way that's coherent and aligned. So you'll see I've got on the left hand side in the triangle a suggestion that an organization is a hierarchy of objectives. We start by knowing what our strategic vision and mission is and we develop that into a set of portfolio and program objectives and functional objectives at a high level. Then we break that down further and further and further until we get to the bottom level of delivery through projects and operations. That needs to be coherent. In other words, it all hangs together. There aren't any gaps and aligned, all pointing in the same direction. So when we fulfill all of our bottom level objectives, the projects and the operations, if we do that, then we, we fulfill our program objectives. And when we fulfill all our program objectives, we fulfill the requirements of the programs, and uh, the portfolios and functions. When we deal with that, we finally achieve our strategic mission. So they have to be coherent and aligned. And what we're doing here is saying, we'll start at the top in terms of sustainability. Make sure we know what we have to do as a business to be sustainable. Then we roll that down the organization through the hierarchy of objectives in a way that is coherent and aligned. So that when we get to the bottom, we're doing tactical risk, uh, tactical risk assessment, tactical risk management, using lower level risk assessment criteria that apply to the project or the operations 
within the context of the overall business and the whole thing hangs together. And if it doesn't hang together, then our work as project managers at the bottom is a waste of time. You can have a fantastic gold-plated project and if the company is going to the dogs, it's a waste of time. You're wasting your time. You've got to have a company which is sustainable, which knows that it's going, knows where it's going and how it's going to get there, and then using its projects and operations to deliver that, and then we can make a difference. We can't make a difference as project managers if our organizations are not sustainable. So that's why sustainability needs to start at the top, and we can influence upwards as, as projects and program managers uh, to make sure that happens. Okay, let me finish off just with a few thoughts of where we go from here. And I would invite you to be thinking about questions. So we've got plenty of time for questions. And if you, if you want to put questions online uh, in, in the chat box, please do, and Merv will tell us what they are. So sustainability is, by definition, a good thing. Everybody knows that, right? Hooray, we want sustainability. And that's what Glasgow is all about, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals and so on. Everybody knows we want this. But it's not easy. In fact, achieving it is uncertain. We're not quite sure how we're going to get there. And for businesses, we need to know what we're going to do in sustainability risk management to make sure our businesses are sustainable. And the way that the, 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 sort of the big conversations that we're having in Glasgow and elsewhere are not going to help us as businesses because they're not at the right level of detail. We need to know as businesses, and then through that to our portfolios, programs, and projects, how are we actually going to do this in practice? So we need to define sustainability in terms that we can measure for our business, for my business, for your business, doing that by mapping the necessary resources through the five capitals onto your strategic objectives, and then turning that into quantifiable risk assessment criteria. Doing a vulnerability assessment to work out which resources are at risk, and then managing the risks to the key vulnerabilities. And I've just put a little reminder in here, don't forget that risk has upside as well as downside. So when we're managing risk, we can be managing opportunities as well as threats. There are some risks that if they happen, some uncertainties that if they occur, would help us to remain sustainable. Things that would, be, you know, if we develop new technologies that will help us to, um, you know, to, to carbon capture, for example, um, or for some of the um, other sustainable technologies. There are upsides that we need to manage as well as downsides. So we need to be able to do this. Define sustainability in terms that matter for my business. Work out which of my necessary resources are vulnerable. Then manage the risks to those vulnerable resources so that my business will stay sustainable. That will mean that my business will be sustainable, my projects will be sustainable, and ultimately, because projects change and shape the future, when we get projects and businesses that are sustainable, the future will be sustainable and we'll all be still here in 50 years time or, or our children or grandchildren. Okay, so what? You know, interesting, new ideas. What we really don't want is for Greta to come in the back door and say, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Um, you know, these are new ideas. This is a new presentation. There's some thoughts I've been having for 15 years or so, but crystallized today for you, world premier. But what are you going to do? Um, are you going to take these blah, 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 Chelsea going on again. Uh, are these things that you can use? Is this actually creating any valuable insight that will make a difference? That's what we, re we really want. If you want your business to be sustainable and through your business, your projects, you're going to have to think about this. Hard thinking and hard work. This framework does make sense. It does work. I have proved it with clients in multiple different countries and different industries around the world, myself and others in my partnership, but it's hard work. You can't take what I've just shown you on these slides and say, copy that out and we'll have that for our business. You have to think for your business, what are our strategic objectives? What are our necessary resources? Which of those are vulnerable for us? And if they're not there, how much does it matter for us? You have to do that to get your corporate risk appetite proper, properly uh, defined and then roll that through the business. You can't do that in five minutes. But if we don't do it, what would happen? Our businesses would not be sustainable. We'll be great project managers, be defunct businesses that don't stay around. But nobody wants that. We've got to do something differently. That is the Greta Thunberg blah, blah, blah message. Don't just listen and say, yeah, we'll do something differently. You've got to do it. And uh, I would recommend that you take some of these ideas and think 
and try and work them through with some of your colleagues and maybe give me a ring and, and uh, drop me an email and let me know how you're getting on. We can sort of work together. Because if we don't do anything differently, you know that saying, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And if what you always get isn't good enough, you need to do something differently, right? Okay, so that's enough for me. I hope you found that interesting. Um, it is over to you, not only for questions, but for you to work out how to put this into practice. Uh, and I hope what I've given you will make that possible.